you to stand up to your feet. We got a brand new song for you. The word says, I am trading my sorrows and I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. So I challenge you today to embrace your blessings as we sing. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. Persecuted, not abandoned Struck down, but not destroyed I am blessed beyond the curse For His promise will endure That His joy is gonna be my strength Yeah No sorrow may last all night to y'all for a minute. Scripture tells us that weeping may endure for a night, but joy does come in the morning. And morning doesn't just mean when the sun rises or having an AM next to it. Morning means when you decide to wake up. So right here, right now, when you wake up and choose joy, hey, wake up! Cause joy is here, wake up! Help me out, y'all. died 
Eddie Rose in those walls of rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave? But they were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. In those giants are dead now. Come on, this is our God. Say this is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. And this is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross and beat the grave. So let That fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But He heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness They tell the story
wide range of emotions. And they can be confusing sometimes. It's easy to wonder, am I too emotional? Not emotional enough? Why don't my feelings make sense? Why can't I make myself feel differently? What we do know is that God gave us our emotions, and when we use them as intended, they can help us sort through the challenges of this life. So how do we do that? It's time to talk about emotions. It's time to explore all the feels. Well, the idea for this series came from a conversation my dad and I had right after Christmas. We were just hanging out and going for a drive, and we were talking about, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. When you get two ADHD people together in the same conversation, all kinds of topics come up. We talked about all kinds of things. We so, somehow landed on the topic of emotion. Um, and we talked about it for quite a while. And uh, my dad said, hey, you, you really have to do a series on this. And uh, so we began to just sort of think about, um, you know, what would that look like? What would it look like to do a series completely on the idea of emotions? <clears throat> and I, I think what what was interesting about that conversation, and maybe I didn't realize it until we were having that talk that day, is I've had kind of a unique and strange journey dealing with some of the emotional misconceptions that I used to have. I used to have some really deeply held misconceptions about emotions, and my journey to sort of like work through those has been kind of strange, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. On the one hand, so I, I live in several different zones. On the one hand, I'm, I'm a, a pastor, and that's my, my primary role and my primary calling, and so I I serve here as the senior associate pastor, and I've been here for 14 years, and uh, I've done a lot of, of pastoral counseling and coaching, mostly with distressed married couples. I don't do as much of that now as I used to, but um, I used to do a lot of that. And so uh, dealing with emotions is a huge part of that, right? When I, I found that when people came to me to talk about marital problems they were having, emotion was always a really big part of what we were working with. And so I was sort of developing a lot of questions that I was going to scripture with as a pastor. Okay, what does the Bible say about this? And what does the Bible say about that? But then I also am a university professor uh, teaching psychology, and, and I've been doing that for about five years. You might be surprised to learn this, but actually mostly I teach research methods and, and um, high-level statistics. And so that's kind of my world. But um, I, Jerry Falwell Sr. used to say, if it's Christian, it ought to be better. And that wasn't a statement of arrogance. He was saying, if we're going to operate in scientific fields and, and fields where there are a lot of people who aren't Christians and don't know much about us, we need to work that much harder to show our sincerity and being good at what we do. And so I'm very proud to say I get to train the next generation of Christian psychology professionals and work with them as, as we want to be God's salt and light in this world. We want to do great science. And by the way, somebody might be saying, Jonathan, Bringing science into the auditorium? Mm, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Science and, and Christianity at the same time. You understand science is God's invention, right? Um, so one of the challenges is that if science is done incorrectly, it can argue with God, and that's created some problems over time. But what you should know is so long as we do the science right, it will always vindicate the Bible. It won't argue with it. And what we're doing as we do science, whether it's medical science or if you uh, work in my field where I am an active um, research psychologist. So not only do I teach, I also am constantly researching burnout and chronic stress. That's the area that I do research in. Um, I'm trying to learn more about God's creation. I'm not trying to subvert God. I'm trying to learn more about what God has given us in, in our humanity and learn more about how to approach it. And so if you're wondering, Jonathan, why would we be talking about psychology in church, I would say psychology was God's invention. So it's okay for us to talk about these things. All of this is within God's sphere. Um, and as long as we do the science right, we'll come to the right conclusions. Having said that, these won't be psychology lectures. Um, I give a lot of those, and that's not what I'm doing here. I'm going to keep taking you back to Scripture, but we're going to kind of integrate this a little bit, and we're going to learn about emotions. So my point is, as both a pastor and a psychology professor and a research psychologist, I've studied emotions from a lot of different angles. And those different angles have given me a, kind of a, a different take on emotions than I ever had before. And really, it helped me with some of the myths that I had come to believe. And that's what my dad and I were talking about that day. And that's what I want to share with you. So really, this is more just a walkthrough of my journey than anything else. So we're going to start off our time together. And, and by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, let me file a flight plan with you. Last two weeks of this series, there's only three weeks. Last two weeks of, these series, of this series, we're going to talk about something called emotion regulation, which is my ability to manage my emotions, right? Um, but in order to get to the point where we can talk about managing our emotions, we have to be able to think about our emotions correctly. We have to understand 
why God gave us our emotions, and we have to make sure that we don't have any misconceptions that are coloring our view in a negative way of emotions, and that's what we're gonna spend today with. So let's start off with a little bit of emotion myth busting. And I'm gonna tell you, the myths that I'm getting ready to show you are ones that I would have all, I would have signed off on all of these at one point or another in my life. At some point in my life I would have said, yeah, this is true to all of these. And I'm just gonna go through them really quickly, I'm not gonna address them all, once we're done, <clears throat> we'll come back and we'll look at the truth of God's word and how, it, and how it addresses these myths. The first myth is this, that emotions equal drama and emotions create new problems, right? Now, <clears throat> some of you may be like me in the, fact, in, in the sense that I have a severe allergy uh, to drama, right? I just don't, I don't do well with it, right? Um, but drama actually is an unnecessary inflating of a situation to create more problems than there were in the first place. And that is not what emotion does. There can be an emotional element in drama, but emotion is not, you, we cannot make emotion responsible for drama when it shows up, right? Emotion is a God-given thing, it's a good thing. Again, we'll come back to this in a minute. We'll, we'll bust this myth in a minute, but for some of us, this is one of the reasons why we were even a little hesitant to even come to this series, right? I don't really wanna talk about emotions because emotions just equal drama. So there's always, you know, this is all gonna be just about, you know, melodramatic life stuff that I don't even wanna get into. Now, emotions don't equal drama, and I'll prove it to you in a minute. Um, myth number two is this, that psychologically healthy and mature people are logical and not emotional. How many of you have heard that at some point in time? If you're healthy, you will be a logical person, you won't be an emotional person. Well, God gave us both logic and emotion, and I hate to break this to you if you're in the room and you think that you are a logical person, but we are all both logical and emotional. Right? Every single one of us in this room is both logical and emotional. And there is, in a sense, a tug of war going on in our brains between emotion and logic, and there's a balance that takes place there. Now, we're gonna talk in the next couple of weeks about what can happen where we can sort of lose our balance and we lose our ability to have both of those, logic and emotion, playing a role together, and that can be problematic. But in the end, right, it's not that I need to shut off one so that the other works. I don't need to shut off emotion so that my logic works, and that's what a lot of people believe. My logic would work a lot better if I could just not be emotional if I just didn't have any emotions, or if I could feel emotions at a much lower level. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Myth number three is this, focusing on your emotions makes you a selfish person. And this may be what I get some emails about this week. I may get some emails about why are we talking about psychology in church, but I already answered that, so I probably won't answer those emails. <laughs> but I might get some emails from somebody who says, you know, Jonathan, it seems like you're wanting us to be selfish, like just focus inward and just look at ourselves constantly and, doesn't God not want us to be selfish? Yeah, selfishness is not part of, of Christ-likeness. It's not part of the Christian life. But we're gonna talk about the fact that just because I am aware of myself, just because I'm paying attention to what's going on within myself does not make me a selfish person. And I will prove that to you in short order. Myth number four, we'd all be much more Christ-like if we could just be a little less emotional. Now that is a quote. I didn't write that. I borrowed that. Um, back in the days when I used to do a lot of marriage pastoral counseling, I used to have these long intake forms where people would give me lots of information about what was bringing them in. And, and I, I don't know how much you know about what it's like to be a marriage counselor, but what happens most of the time, not most of the time, all right, what, what happens a sliver of the time is people will drop their spouse off with you and say, fix them. Because <laughs> I have no problems and they're obviously the problem. And this was one of those note pages, it was full of, they're the problem, I have no problems, and they were talking about, my, she, she's so emotional, I just cannot deal with all of this emotion from her, and at the end was this sentence, we'd all be much more Christ-like if we could just be a little less emotional. I'm gonna bust that myth so hard. <laughs> just wait and see. Um, myth number five, good emotions are okay, but stay away from those bad emotions. Now, this is an interesting thing because in the field of psychology, we've changed our opinion about this a lot. If you, if you look at really old textbooks, you might see good and bad used to refer to emotions. In more recent textbooks, you might see positive and negative, and that's still out there quite a bit. But in these days, we're starting to try to use the words pleasant and unpleasant. 
For, and, and actually, this, is, this makes sense if you think about it from a God vantage point. God gave us these emotions. They're not good or bad, and we'll talk about that later. They're, they're neutral, but some of them are pleasant and some of them are unpleasant. So there's, there's certainly emotions I would rather experience than others, that's for sure, right? But all of those emotions are helpful and all of those emotions are needed. Myth number six, and then we'll start getting into the truths that will help us bust these myths. Myth number six is that getting emotional always leads to conflict or arguments. I told you I would have signed off on all of these at some point in time, but this one I would have signed off on and put exclamation points at the end of. Because I, many of you know that my wife and I had a lot of conflict in the early years of our marriage and it created a lot of challenges for us. And one of the things that I believed at the time is that to be emotional was just a pipeline into conflict. That the, the more we would get into our emotions, the more it would be this this straight pipeline into having a fight and there would be arguments and it, we could just, you know, if we could just remove emotion from the equation, we wouldn't have conflict and we wouldn't have these problems. All right, maybe those aren't all something that you carry around, but many of us are carrying around at least a few of them. And I wanna take you to scripture to talk to you about how we can look at these and understand why these things are not true. The first truth, and this is maybe the most important one, and when I teach a class, uh, at the university and we talk about emotions, I've always started off by saying God gave us our emotions and that's the most important thing I can tell you. And I'm now going to change that lecture because after studying this week, I think there's a truth that is even more primary than the fact that God gave us our emotions. And it is this, it's the truth that we serve an emotional God. It's a bigger thing than God gave us our emotions. It is that God himself is an emotional person. And I found that starting in Genesis, reading through, God's emotions are spelled out in Genesis. Look at what God is saying before the flood and going through scripture over and over again. God is letting humanity know what his emotions are about things. We serve an emotional God. But because my time is limited, let me just take you to the gospels and let's talk about the son of God. Let's talk about Jesus and his emotions. And as we do that, let me invite you to look for not just the emotion, but the intensity of emotion. Because one of the other things that sometimes we carry around is the idea, well, emotion is okay so long, it's, so long as the volume is way down on the emotion. Like loud emotions, intense emotions, like that's not okay. Like I, I, don't, I don't want intensity. So just so long as they're not very intense, emotions are all right. I would invite you as we look at these scriptures to look at both Jesus' emotion and his intensity of emotion. In Mark 3, there is the situation where Jesus is going into the synagogue. He's, he's in the middle of his ministry, and there's a man in the synagogue with a deformed or withered hand. And so the hope here of people standing around is that Jesus will heal this man. Um, and so the Pharisees are also there, and it's a very tense situation because it's the Sabbath. And the, and, and the idea was that on the Sabbath, you didn't do work, you rested, and that was what God had set up as a rule. But the Pharisees as they always did, would take those rules to extremes, incredible extremes, and in their mind, you should never lift a finger to do anything under any circumstances on the Sabbath. And so this was their opportunity. If Jesus healed this man, which seemed to be the right thing to do, they could accuse him of doing the wrong thing. And that's what the Pharisees were always trying to do. They understood he tended to do the right thing, but the thought was if we could catch him and make it look like the wrong thing, then, then that would work for us. And so they were hoping he would heal this guy so they could say he was healing on the Sabbath. And I think this was difficult for Jesus because Jesus understood the whole point of the Sabbath was a healing point. The rest is a healing thing. And so the idea of healing someone on the Sabbath made all the sense in the world to Jesus. And so this is a situation that we find ourselves in. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. And then he turned to his critics, that would be the Pharisees, and asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. <clears throat> when I read this passage as a kid, I used to think that them not answering was because they didn't know the answer to his question. That's not what's happening here at all. What's happening is Jesus is leaving a space for them to speak up and say, if you can heal him, then you should. That's what he's doing. He's given them the information they need to look inside and go, I'm in the wrong here. And to, and to say, if it's possible to heal him, then you should. And there were crickets. What the Pharisees were doing was basically saying, if this guy has to live with the deformed hand for the rest of his life, that's less important to us than whether or not we save face and people follow our rules. I don't know if that makes you mad. It makes me mad. Guess what? It made Jesus mad. 
Check this out. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened. Okay, we have emotion. He's angry and he's sad. But not just anger and sadness, deep anger and sadness. And what you will find as you look at the the mentions of Jesus' emotion in the Gospels is almost never do we get just just an emotion. It's always, he had deep feelings of compassion. There was this deep and intense feeling that we see from Jesus. When he he had emotion, it was deep emotion. And we can go forward uh, to uh, Mark chapter 8. Jesus had just fed the 4,000 miraculously. Would you not agree with me that in feeding the 4,000, Jesus had certainly demonstrated that he was God? That was an incredible, miraculous sign. Problem is, the Pharisees did not want signs on Jesus' terms. They wanted signs on their terms. So they come to Jesus saying, do a sign that, that we dictate. We'll give, you the, we'll give you the parameters. You do our sign, right? Even though he had just fed 4,000 people. Here's, here's the thing, by the way, and this is way off topic, but if you ever find yourself in a religious crowd or a religious tradition or a religious group where the thought is that we get to demand what God does, we're gonna tell God, you must do this, and often it's connected with signs and wonders, we're gonna demand that God do this miracle, run far and run fast, that's not the way it works. God does miracles on his terms, he doesn't do miracles on our terms, right? And so, the Pharisees show up and they demand a sign and this is, this is the response. When he heard this, he did what? He sighed deeply in his spirit. Now this is an emotion parents can understand. <clears throat> your parents, you ever sigh deeply in your spirit, right? This is sadness, it's frustration, it might be a little bit of anger, it's disappointment, right? All of those emotions. And he says, why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? But do you see what I'm saying? It's not just that Jesus sighed. Do you notice the intensity? He sighed deeply in his spirit. All right, let's keep going. Lazarus, the story of Lazarus is really important for understanding Jesus' emotion. So you have, Jesus has these three friends in Bethany, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and he would spend time with them whenever he happened to be in their, um, in their neighborhood, in their area. And uh, he was um, away from them ministering, and Lazarus got really sick. And Mary and Martha thought, well, We'll just get Jesus back here and he will just heal him because they had seen him heal tons and tons of strangers. I mean, I guess for Jesus, there is no such thing as a stranger, but in Mary and Martha's mind, he healed tons of people he didn't even know. And Lazarus was a good friend. Surely Jesus would come back and heal Lazarus, but he didn't show up and Lazarus died. And on the heels of that, there's the funeral. I think Mary and Martha are bewildered trying to figure out what's going on. And when Jesus actually does get back, the funeral is in full swing. And, and in that time, in the ancient culture, there would have been paid mourners that would be crying loudly, and, and there was a whole different kind of culture around funerals. It was a big thing. And Jesus walked into this, and this is what the scripture says in John 11. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep, what, anger. Sometimes we rush right to Jesus wept. But we need to remember that at, at Lazarus' tomb, Jesus was angry. Not just angry, there was a deep anger that welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. He, where have you put him, he asked, and they told him, Lord, come and see, and then Jesus wept. Think about all these emotions, right? There is deep anger, there is being troubled, there is weeping, and we're not done yet. When he was weeping at the tomb, the people said, see how much he loved him. Now, in church, a lot of times when we talk about love, we're talking about a word that's translated from uh, the word agape, and agape means uh, sacrificial love, an act of love. It's not a feeling, it's, it's something that I do, it's a, it's a life choice. But that's not the word that's getting translated love here. This word is phileo, which means feelings of brotherly love. It is a feelings of affection. And that's what people are saying. Look at the deep feelings of affection that he had for this person. I've talked to people before, before funerals, I, I will often go and speak with the family the 15 minutes before, and you know, we'll pray with the family. And I was doing a funeral four or five years ago and uh, could just tell the father of the, of the middle-aged man who died was really having a difficult time. And so I stopped and asked him, I said, are, are you doing okay? And he said, he said, you have no idea how hard it is to keep it together right now. And I understand where he's coming from, but I wanted to remind him that Jesus didn't keep it together at Lazarus' tomb. Nobody told Jesus that he needed to not cry. It was okay for him to be angry. It was okay for him to be troubled. It was okay for him to be sad, right? There are moments in life where it's, it's not our responsibility to keep it together, that the pain is so deep. And, and if we would say, no, I have to, then I think we gotta go back to Jesus and say, well, then why did he not have to? Why am I holding myself to a standard of, of not feeling the feels when I'm going through a difficult situation when Jesus felt the feels when he was going through a difficult situation? Well, 
One of the most common feelings that Jesus had was compassion, which is a, another word for empathy, the, to, to feel for, to feel with, right? Um, in Matthew 9, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. In uh, Matthew 14, Jesus saw the huge crowd and he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. There was one time when Jesus ended up right next to another funeral. There was a funeral procession. It was a widow and her only son, and the son had, had, had died, and, and there was all of this mourning, and, and I think Jesus was really touched by this, this mother's painful uh, experience. And the Bible says as the funeral procession was coming out, uh, the young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart did what? Overflowed with compassion. There's the emotion and there's the intensity. His heart overflowed with compassion. Hmm. So I think it's very difficult for us to suggest that in order to be like, in order to be a Christian, I have to bottle up my emotions. A good Christian will bottle up their emotions. I mean, Jesus wept just because he saw the city of Jerusalem and he was disappointed with what was happening to his beloved city. That, that was not, you know, some of you might be, well, okay, you cry at a funeral, that makes sense, right? And Jesus is walking along and, and he sees Jerusalem off in the distance and thinks about what's happening to the city of God and he begins to weep. No, Jesus was an emotional person. And, and, and by the way, I'm gonna skip past one passage and move to one other thing here. You might say, well, Jonathan, these all seem like unpleasant emotions. You told me not to say negative, you said unpleasant. So these all seem like unpleasant emotions. Well, scripture also tells us that Jesus had pleasant emotions. We can go to Luke 10, it says at the same time, Jesus was filled with joy, right? Okay, joy is the emotion, filled with is the intensity. The one thing you and I have to agree on is that Jesus had intense emotions. So right off the bat, we can bust myth number four, that we'd all be much more Christ-like if we were a little less emotional. I would actually present to you the idea that we all might be a little more Christ-like if we were a little more emotional. That if we could really feel what God wants us to feel in a, in a certain situation. And we're gonna talk about that next week, by the way. We're gonna talk about the fact that sometimes we can have a feeling that is not the right feeling for what we're going through. I'm gonna talk about how we can kind of try to adjust to where we're feeling something that is more helpful to us in the situation. But I think the important point here is to say, no, the idea that God doesn't want me to feel intense emotion, and, I, and there are a lot of emotions God doesn't want me to feel, I would push back against that and say, no, we serve an emotional God, and Jesus demonstrated intense emotions, and so it's clearly not a Christ-likeness thing to stuff our emotions, right? Also, by the way, this busts myth number one, that emotions equal drama and emotion create new problems. Jesus was not about creating drama and he certainly didn't create new problems. Jesus lived a perfect life. And so the idea that emotion is what creates the imperfection in me doesn't work because we know that Jesus lived a perfect life and also had deep emotion. So I cannot say the reason that I, I do wrong things is because I'm an emotional person. Now that doesn't quite, doesn't quite work. And one other myth that this busts is the idea that psychologically healthy and mature people are logical and not emotional. In order to believe this myth, we would then have to believe that Jesus was not psychologically healthy or mature. I've talked to guys over the years who will tell me in my office, they'll say, you know, when I was growing up, I learned that, you know, real men don't cry. And usually that conversation will now branch out into one of two directions. They will either say, and boy, did, was that not true, right? Or I'll get, and I know everybody doesn't think that's true anymore, but you know, I still kind of think that's the right way to go. Well, I, can, I, I, I appreciate and, under, and, and respect that person's viewpoint, but I have to say, if your idea is that real men don't cry, then you have a little bit of a problem with Jesus. I would say Jesus was an example of real manhood, and he clearly did cry multiple times. All right, let's keep going. So let's, let's bust a few other myths. Um, let's start with this truth, and this is really important. Truth number two is that self-awareness is different from self-absorption. They're very different, as a matter of fact. Let me give you kind of a metaphor for this. When, uh, about 10 years ago, my wife and I went on a cruise. It was not a good cruise. It was really rough seas the whole time. It was our last cruise. It was our first and last. Um, <laughs> we, were on this, we were on this cruise, and... Right, you know, we were on the, 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 our rooms were on the Lido deck, as I recall, and you go out and you would see the bridge out there, and it had a glass back, so you could see the captain. Is that the right term? The captain that should walk, pacing back and forth, and always with the binoculars, always with the binoculars, looking out at the ocean, and I appreciated that, because I want the captain of the ship to be ocean aware. I want the captain to have awareness of the ocean, because if the captain doesn't have awareness of the ocean, some very, very bad things can happen right? On the other hand, 
If the captain were walking along the side of the boat and somebody nudged him overboard and he's now drowning in the ocean, that is ocean absorbed and that's not a good thing. Right? So there is a difference between self-awareness and self-absorption. I don't wanna drown in self, but I do need to have the binoculars out and be paying attention to myself. I need to pay attention to what I'm doing, the choices that I'm making, the way that I feel, the way that I interact with other people, the way that they tend to interact with me, the way, if I, if I take it as a whole, how people interact with me, I can learn a lot about myself. And, and you know, I learn about my boundaries. Oh, self-awareness is a topic that deserves its own uh, series. But emotional awareness is part of that, paying attention to how I feel about things. How do I feel, how did I feel when that happens? There's a reason why. Right when, when you go into therapy and you sit with a trained counselor and you begin to tell them something's going on with your life and they say, well, how do you feel about that? They're not doing that because it's like off a script somewhere or it's because a way of just keeping the session going so they can bill you at the end. It has nothing to do with that. What it is is trying to help you practice the skill of being aware of what's happening inside of me as this is, as this is going on. And so it's okay to be aware of our emotions, right? So I, I think with that, we can sort of bust the myth that focusing on your emotions makes you a selfish person. Drowning in your emotions does, but focusing on your emotions does not. By the way, you say, now, Jonathan, now you really, really are into the whole psychology thing and you're way off from the Bible. No, I don't think so. Check this out in Proverbs 4. Guard your heart, and here the idea of the heart is my truest self, that includes my emotions, it includes my beliefs, my firmly held beliefs. It is the eternal part of me that goes on living even after this body that I lives in gives up and goes away. The Bible says, guard that part of yourself for it determines the course of your life. And by the way, the word that gets translated guard there has as part of its meaning to be continually focused on, to be continually aware as a guard would, like if, if you're hiring a guard to, to to keep a property safe, you would be consistently wanting them to monitor that property. You would put them in front of a, a, a screen full of cameras so they could consistently be aware of what is happening on that property. And then what God is saying is your heart is too important to just leave it. And here's the other thing. Man, I'm breaking a lot of sentences. Here's the other thing. Some of us think in, in, in the Christian world that God doesn't want us to be self-focused God wants us to be other focused. And what we mean by that is God hasn't called me to look at myself. That would be selfish. God has called me to fix everybody else. So my job is to pay attention to what everybody else is doing and try to set them straight. Did you know that is scripturally opposite from what God has called us to do? The Bible says that we are to focus on our own work or our own life product because that is what God will hold us accountable for. I will not stand in judgment accountable for other people. I will be accountable for myself. And so I don't need to, I, it, it can, I can start to get in a place, and, and anybody who's been in my office and heard me counsel, you probably heard me talk about this at some point in time, that most people in my life have not invited me to be their coach. All right, when people come in and sit in my office, there's a sense in which, you know, life coaching and all that, I get that. But most people have not invited me to be their coach. But what I can do is I can get to a place where I think God has called me to diagnose what's wrong with everybody around me and coach them up into how, how to be a better person. But when I do that, I have to pay less attention to myself. And that's why Paul was telling us, pay attention to yourself. Because the less we pay attention to ourself, guess what? The more hyper-focused we become on everybody else and what they're doing. And the more we become disappointed and the more we lose track of what's happening and we can start to behave in some very counterproductive ways. All right, truth number three, and this may be a big one to accept. Some of you may be, I don't know, Jonathan, how I feel about that, but give it some time and let it settle. That emotions aren't good or bad. They're just signals that let us know something needs our attention, right? Like the, and it's a common illustration about emotions to say it's like the, the lights on the dash of your vehicle, right? I was a mechanic in my early 20s. Um, and always had people coming in the shop with the check engine light on in their car, right? Now, my question to you is, is the check engine light bad? No, it's not bad, right? It's just letting me know something's going on under the hood that needs to be addressed, right? Now, I can get mad at the light, and plenty of people did. I heard some people say some very not nice things about their check engine light. But the light is not the problem. Can we agree that the light is not the problem? Actually, the light is doing its job. It's just letting us know that something's going on under the hood. So it's very easy to get mad at emotions when the truth is the emotions are doing their job. Just letting me know something needs to be addressed, right? And so um, let me show you this. This is from Dr. Parrott, a scientist who studies emotions, and he gave us um, a classification system for emotions where we have primary, secondary, tertiary, and all this. So it's a 
big bracket of emotions that goes from very primary emotions to very nuanced ones. But I'm just gonna show you the primary ones. Uh, love, joy, surprise, anger, suffering, which is connected to sadness here in his uh, taxonomy, and fear. Here's my question to you. Looking at the screen, which of these are you prepared to give up? Now, I will agree with you that some of these are more pleasant than others, but I'm not ready to give up any of these because these are all important signals. For instance, if I experience anger, that may not be an, a pleasant emotion, but anger is a signal to let me know that something is unfair or something is unjust or that there's a problem that I need to solve that for some reason I'm not being able to solve, right? I can learn from anger. Emotions are there to teach us something. I can learn from anger and I can, I can work with anger, right? Or sadness. Sadness is there to let me know I've lost something very important, right? A lot of people who are going through grief prolong their grief by trying to push away the sadness. They don't want to be sad, but the truth is the sadness is an honor and a tribute to the person that I lost. The reason that I'm sad when that person dies is because I love them so much. And the sadness is an indicator light to let me know, hey, this is a big deal. This is a big loss and it's okay for you to be sad. But as I said, some folks get really upset at the emotions and we start to think of them in terms of good and bad. They're not good or bad. They're just letting us know that something under the hood needs some attention. So we could define emotions. You know how I love a working definition. Um, this isn't a very academic definition, but it'll work. Emotions are feelings that tell us something is happening that needs our attention, right? So if we listen to our emotions, we can actually get somewhere with them. If we fight back against our emotions or if we classify them in a bad way, it can really sort of stunt our ability to move forward. Now, quickly, and I don't have a lot of time, but I wanna talk very quickly about two reasons that I think people struggle to accept emotions in themselves and others. Because this is, this is a relational challenge. If a person struggles to accept my own emotions and other people's emotions, it can be really difficult to move forward in relationships. One big reason is that often what needs our attention, so the reason the light came on, is something that can't be solved right now. Remember I just talked about the death of a loved one. I cannot solve that. I sit with a lot of people who've gone through the traumatic loss of a loved one, and I cannot make that person reappear. I would love to if I could, but I cannot, right? I, I, I cannot make somebody not be sick, right? I cannot do God's job. I, I cannot, I have no miracle performing powers to make the emotion neutralized by fixing the problem. And I think some of us really want to do that. We just want to fix the problem. We just want to solve it. So emotions are, are okay with us so long, it is, is it, so long as it is solvable now. If I can solve the emotion right now, I'm okay with the emotion. But if, if the emotion is going to last because there's not something that we can do about it, then I'm not okay with it anymore. This is what I teach my students, and I'll share it with you. One of the most difficult but important emotional skills you can ever develop is to sit with what cannot be solved. So... My job as a pastor, when I'm there with somebody who's lost a loved one, is to sit with the grief, to sit with the sadness. I can't make the sadness go away. But what does the scripture tell us to do? Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. God doesn't ask me to fix why they're weeping or, or to address why they're rejoicing. Jesus, all God has told us to do is to be there with them, sit there with them in what they're going through and try to be congruent with what they're going through. If they're weeping, try to show them that they're not alone in their sadness. If they're rejoicing, try to, share, to show them they're not alone in their joy, right? Because human beings were built for connection. And so part of my ability to accept other people's emotions is to make peace with the fact that I cannot fix the brokenness of this world. God will eventually do that, but that, that's not something that I have the ability to do. This other part that I only have a few minutes left to cover, I think is the part that my dad was really excited about that was why he wanted me to do this series. Now, come back for the next two weeks, please. But I wanna go over this because it's so, so important, and that is we tend to confuse emotions with conclusions. It's a big, big problem that we see something happen around us and we draw a conclusion about it, but we slip it in under the cover of a feeling. I feel this way, but it's not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's not like one of the things I put there before, it's not like I feel angry or I feel sad, instead I feel like, and then we give somebody a conclusion, something that, something that we believe based off what we've seen. The only problem is they don't believe what we believe and we get into an argument. That's why a lot of people think that emotions are just like, they're bound to cause, as myth number six says, bound to cause conflict or an argument. Here's, here's what I would tell you. I would tell you that conflict comes from being conclusional, not from being emotional. I thought I made that word up, conclusional, and then I looked it up and somebody beat me to it. But <laughs> Again, think about how hard it is to argue with real emotions. If somebody says, you know, when, when this happened, I just felt really angry. 
Well, you might not agree with them that anger was the right thing to feel in that moment, but it is hard to argue with, isn't it? If somebody says, I feel really angry, what are you going to say? No, you don't. It's very difficult to argue with, right? Let me show you what I mean. Let me give you an example. So look at the difference. I'm going to give you two different statements, but first let's look at this one. When you made that joke at my expense, I felt like, so I'm expecting an emotion, I felt like you just don't realize how inconsiderate you can be sometimes. That's not an emotion, is it? That's a conclusion. And there's actually multiple conclusions in there. You're inconsiderate. You don't realize you're inconsiderate. Like there's a lot of stuff going on there. Here's my question to you. Do you think the person that I'm saying this to also thinks that they're inconsiderate and that they don't realize that they're inconsiderate? Probably not. And we're gonna be headed for an argument real fast, right? Because we have very incompatible beliefs and we're gonna be going at it, right? Versus, check this out as a, as a change. So instead of, when you made that joke at my expense, I felt like you just don't realize how inconsiderate you can be sometimes to, when you made that joke at my expense, I felt hurt. It's a lot harder to, harder to argue with that, isn't it? I might not like that it made them feel hurt. I might think that there was no reason for them to feel hurt. But at the end of the day, the one thing I have to make peace with is they're telling me how they felt and that's how they felt. See, that's what the power of emotions. Most of us have, and, and I mean that I, I'm pointing the finger back at myself as well as everybody else, but most of us, and we know this especially with the English language, most of us have very limited emotional vocabularies. We don't use a lot of emotion words. We might use angry, we might use frustrated, we might use sad, but you know, there's tons and tons of emotion words out there. And, but the problem is we're so preoccupied with using our conclusions, telling people what we've decided to believe. What is the problem with that? The problem is my emotions happen in the moment and, and they are there to teach me something, but instead of learning from them, I jump three or four steps ahead. How many of you like to play chess? Right, not very many. Okay, so there isn't a new spring chess team coming, all right. Um, <laughs> People that are really good at chess think three or four moves ahead, and that makes them so good at what they do. It makes you wonderful at chess, it makes you terrible at relationships. You do not wanna think three or four moves ahead in relationships, they're way too complex to do that, right? I mean, chess is an incredibly simple game compared to relationships, right? So if you think about this, jumping away, and, and once again, you might think, Jonathan, you're not going to the Bible with this. I promise you I am. Back in, in 1 Samuel, we talked about this recently in a different series. You have Saul, the new king of Israel, challenged by Goliath, this huge giant. Remember, Saul's the tallest guy in Israel. He's the new king. He is absolutely, God could not have teed the ball up for Saul to hit it any more than he did. And Saul was afraid and didn't do anything about it. And so David, this teenager, comes in and, and takes care of business and kills Goliath. And at least there is this victory. As they're headed back into town, the ladies wrote this little song they were singing that said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And guess what Saul felt? I'm going to assume he was feeling embarrassed. I'm going to assume he was feeling confused. I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume he was feeling fear, right? And are any of those emotions bad? No, because he could learn from the emotion of embarrassment. Isn't, isn't that true? He could have learned from the emotion of disappointment. He could have learned from the emotion of fear. Could have taught him some very important lessons about what just happened. And also, it could have reminded him to be grateful for the fact that he was still alive. He was very close to being dead just now. He could, he could, have, he could have had, so it could have been a great experience for him. Instead, though, he jumped four steps ahead. Look at this. What's this, he said. By the way, that's the confusion. They credit David with 10,000s and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. Do you see the jump ahead? It's a conclusion. I've now concluded that this is gonna happen. And by the way, those conclusions then inform our behavior. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. So if you wanna understand what went wrong with Saul and David, the Bible is giving us, okay, this is where the chapter turned. Where did the chapter turn? The chapter turned where a conclusion was made, jumping four steps ahead instead of learning from the emotions. What about Elijah? I love to teach about Elijah because, again, I research burnout, and Elijah is a prototypical case of burnout in the Bible. He's a prophet of God, was so successful, had so many victories, and on the heels of a major victory, he's threatened, uh, Jezebel threatens him and uh, says she's gonna kill him, but the truth is Jezebel and Ahab have been threatening him his whole life. This isn't new. His life had been threatened so many times, but for some reason it was the last straw and everything sort of snapped and he went away from where he was ministering, traveled as far away as he could get. He sent his servant away. He sits under a, a single tree in the middle of the desert and asks God to kill him. And there's a conversation that happens between him and God. And I've done a few messages on this, so if you're interested in this, in this story, 
I have messages where I go into a lot more detail. I just want to slice right into the part where Elijah's trying to tell God what's going on. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. What's going on? Sadness? Depletion? Feeling discouraged? Are any of those emotions bad? No. Because they're, they're a learning opportunity. I could learn from the discouragement. I could learn from the sadness. But look, now he jumps four steps ahead, and I'm the only one left. Right? By the way, he gets into an argument with God. Whenever you get into an argument with God, just give up. Job learned that. <laughs> but, but God has to set him straight. Because why? Because he jumped four steps ahead. God told him later on, I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. He's saying, I know you feel discouraged right now, and I know you feel hurt and harmed right now, but I want you to know there's 7,000 people you don't even know about that are followers of me. What about Martha? We talked about Lazarus and Mary and Martha. You know, after Lazarus had come back to life because God called him out of that tomb, uh, Jesus was there with his disciples and they had a big dinner at Martha's house and Martha was preparing the meal and, and there were so many arrangements to take care of and she was working so hard and she realizes that Mary isn't in there helping her and she looks over and in, there's Mary sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him teach and it seems so inappropriate for her to be doing that instead of helping her and she gets angry. And, and, and she feels hurt. Is it wrong for her to feel angry or hurt? No, because she could learn something in that moment from those emotions. But instead, she jumped several steps ahead, uh, says that Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, look for the conclusions. Doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. There's so, many confu con there's so many conclusions there. Number one, just sitting there. No, she was doing something a lot more than just sitting there. She was listening to Jesus, the Savior of the world, teach. That's more than just sitting there. Second of all, she said, doesn't it seem unfair to you? She's drawing the conclusion that Jesus has lost track of what is fair and what is not fair. And she's drawing the conclusion that she needs to set Jesus straight. There's a lot of conclusions in this that aren't really workable propositions. But here's what I want to show you. And this may be one of the, one of the most important things I show you. Jesus takes her out of her conclusions, this is so important, and brings her back into her emotions. Look at this. The Lord said to her, my dear Martha, what, you are worried and upset. Do you get that? She's drawing all the conclusions and Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let's go back to the emotions that you're feeling. You're feeling worried and you're upset. Let's start there. Now we serve an emotional God and he's okay with us going into our emotions because our emotions can teach us something. We gotta be very careful though about jumping into conclusions that are not helpful for us and that create relational difficulty for us and also cause us to be discouraged and depressed and walk away from things that are important to us. Here's the most important truth that I wanna finish out our time with today and then as I said, we'll move forward in the next couple talks and that is that God cares about and empathizes with our emotions. As, as far as I know, this is a unique thing about the Christian faith, is that the God that we serve is a God who empathizes with us. This is in Hebrews uh, chapter four. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, and even a better translation here would be with the feelings of our weaknesses. And that's one of the reasons why some of us struggle with emotion, because emotion reminds us that we're not as strong as we would like to be. Emotion reminds us that as human beings, we have some weakness. And scripture's saying, God is touched by the feeling of our weaknesses. Um, we have one, we have a high priest who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then, so this is the response to that, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I mentioned this at first Wednesday, so if you were there, I apologize for saying the same thing twice. Um, <clears throat> I need to replace my phone, so I have to call the cell phone company, and I hate that. I really, really do, for, for a couple of reasons. One is I never get the right person at first. I end up having to go through a maze of several people to get to the right person, right? And then if I do get frustrated, not like that ever happens, but in the, in the very unusual circumstance that I would get frustrated, you get that thing where they read off the card to you. Mr. Hoover, I can see this is very frustrating to you. <laughs> and you wanna go, I hear you say it, but I'm not sure you feel it. I'm not sure you're feeling what I'm feeling. I, and by the way, in psychology, we call this mentalizing. I can think about what you're feeling. I can logically process what you may be, that's mentalizing or mind reading. Empathizing is to feel with. I resonate with what you're feeling, right? When I was in college, I've had a lot of different jobs over the years. When I was in college, I tuned pianos to m make money as I was in this years and years ago. And uh, so back then I was really interested in piano technology. And one interesting facet of it for me is that when you play a note on the piano, 
those two, one, two, or three strings that get struck by the hammer are not the only things that you hear. Even if the rest of the strings are muted, you are still hearing resonance from every other part of that piano. There's some resonance happening from the entire instrument, and we call that sympathetic resonance. It's not resonating at the same rate as those strings and at the same intensity, and yet it resonates along. I think God created us as human beings to need sympathetic resonance. That's why he calls us to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice. I may not feel it at the same level that you feel it. I may not feel it at the same intensity that you feel it, but I can be around you and resonate with what you're feeling. And here's the cool thing. The Bible tells us we serve a God who resonates with how we feel. And it's not like the phone thing where I call and I have to go through six people to get there. Some of us have been taught that we need to talk to God through a priest, but Hebrews is saying we don't need a priest to talk to God. We can go straight to the God of the universe and talk to him. And more than that, when we talk to him, he cares about how we feel. Now, this is really changing my prayer life because I was taught all these ways of praying when I was in Bible school and all that. But you know what? Nobody ever told me. Nobody ever told me, God wants you to come to him and say, God, I'm scared. God wants you to come to him and say, God, I'm I'm really sad. God, I feel really hurt by this. But I don't know how any other way to read Hebrews than to say the God of the universe wants me to come to him and lay my emotions in front of him and say, this is how I feel because he cares about my emotions and he can resonate. The God of the universe who created all this stuff that we live in, he actually will take the time to feel what I'm feeling and remind me that I'm not alone. Do you remember what David said in Psalm 23? Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you'll be with me. What is he saying? Even when I'm afraid, God is there with me and he resonates with the fear that I feel. Even when I'm sad, God is there with me and he resonates with the sadness that I feel. Even when I'm hurt, God is there with me and he resonates with that hurt. Oh, we're gonna have a lot of fun with emotions over the next couple of weeks. Let me say a word of prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you so much for our time today. Thank you for our ability to focus on your gift of emotions. Help us to uh, be open to thinking about them in different ways. And Father, help us as we spend the next couple weeks talking about ways of managing our emotions to really put some of this into practice and see uh, the gains that you can provide in our life as we do that. And we thank you very much and we ask that you dismiss us with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for being here this week.